Hey friends, it's your pal Mike Shea from Sly Flourish. I ran a Shadow Dark RPG zero level gauntlet yesterday. And today I'm going to talk about my experiences with that, things I picked up, my top top thoughts about this, what my players thought about this, the specific adventure that we ran, and a little bit more, and where we're going with Shadow Dark in the future. This show, like all of the work of Sly Flourish, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, the City of Arches Sourcebook, video previews, the monthly Q&A, the dedicate, a dedicated Discord server, all kinds of great stuff you get for being a patron of Sly Flourish. You should definitely join up. There's a link down in the show notes below to join up. To the patrons of Sly Flourish, thank you so much for your support. So yeah, we had an opportunity yesterday. I had a bunch of players that were out, and then it turned out only one of them was out, but that's cool. And I, because when I thought we only had a few, I thought, well, let's try Shadow Dark. This would be a good opportunity to try a Shadow Dark RPG, try a, specifically the zero-level gauntlet where you generate many zero-level characters and run them through a dungeon to see which ones survive. And then theoretically, those become your characters. I think in our case, they're not going to necessarily become our characters, but that's the general idea behind it. And I've been wanting to play Shadow Dark. My players have been wanting to play Shadow Dark. I think everybody at the table had back the kickstarter so clearly we were into it that was one nice thing is i knew my players understood it from the beginning and were eager to play so we learned a lot we all talked about it a lot we learned about it a lot everybody at the table is also a gm they've all run games they all have played many many games they've played th hundreds to thousands we had boy a lot of experience more than a century, easily, maybe two centuries, maybe as many as two centuries worth of experience running RPGs at that table. So it was a lot of really interesting stuff going on while we're talking about. It. So today we're going to dive, we're going to dive into all of it. We're going to talk about all of it. So first off, my main point, what's the number one thing that I learned running a Shadow Dark RPG zero level gauntlet? What's the one thing that picked it up? And the number one thing is my players and I loved it. We really enjoyed it. It was really fun. It, we were looking forward to it. We sat down. I had 40 zero level character sheets ready to go for five players and a six player joined us later. So we had 40 characters ready to go. We didn't get through them all. We had 10 character deaths. We counted at the end and found out that 10 characters had died, including one character who died in the intro scene. We'll talk about that one fateful character. The true, the true hero, the true sea wolf was the one character who died, I think, three sentences in. And, and they were dead. We'll talk about that person. But we also had, and, and immediately one thing that was clear to me from all of the players that were there, you know, wide range of different, of different players, but all, everybody's into it and everybody understood the themes of the game. Everybody kind of grabbed onto those themes and it really helps, I think, if your players understand what this game is about before they even really sit down for even a session zero is, you know, talk to them each, make them, you know, make them understand, talk to them and so that they can understand what the style of this game was, because it really made a big difference. And that was the immediate grasp on the focus of low power, low magic, a high focus on the importance of equipment, encumbrance, lighting, and the constant threat of danger in the darkness. Those are really, and we'll talk more about like the themes of Shadow Dark, but that idea of like, they all recognize like they had one to two hit points, like a character who had two hit points was a luxury. Most of the time they had one hit point. It wasn't uncommon to have a character with an AC of seven and one hit point. And you're, and you're like, well, oh, they have a torch. Good. That means my next character will have a torch was kind of how the zero level, the zero level game went. So that number one thing, that one important thing that I think I would, I would, I would, you know, I would really emphasize is a, that we had a really good time. I guess it's two things kind of, I'm kind of cheating sort of two things. One, we had a really good time, but we had a good time because all of us grasped what this game was about what the themes of shadow dark are compared to all of the other ttrpgs that we play because this is my group that runs 5e and this group ran fifth edition they ran numenera we ran blades in the dark so we've run a bunch of different kinds of rpgs with this group and we've run a bunch of different kind of rpgs in the last couple of years and like the difference between this and numenera is very very stark for example big difference in sort of the super heroic high fantasy of numenera where you're very empowered and you have lots of capability right at the beginning and this one you have one hit point in an ac of seven and no weapon. You're like, I, can I tie my grappling hook to a rope and use it like a club? And you're like, ah, yeah, maybe. So then what are some, you know, diving down a little bit deeper, like three, three other sort of observations we had is that it was really fun that my players were on board with the theme and style of the game and, and understood the lethality of first level play. I mentioned that one of the characters died in the intro scene. Again, I'll talk about that when we talk about the Seawolf, the, the adventure Horde of the Seawolf King, which is in Curse Scroll 3. And that is the actual adventure. It's, it's written, Kelsey Dion wrote this adventure for Shadow Dark. It came with the Shadow Dark Kickstarter. I think if you backed it at a certain level, you got all three of the Curse Scrolls, but you can pick it up individually as well. 
well. And it is designed by Kelsey as a zero level gauntlet. And I have lots of interesting observations about that. The real focus of this game is on limited equipment, encumbrance, the importance of tracking how much stuff you can carry, torchlight, random encounters, turn tracking, character death. That's really what defines Shadow Dark differently than other RPGs, I would say. And one other thing I found is that tracking rounds was a little tricky, that it was a little bit of extra bookkeeping I was not really prepared for. I did it. I knew the importance of turn tracking with random encounters, especially when you're doing like crawling through a dungeon. I knew it was important to track turns. It was just something. It was like one other thing I had to do. It wasn't really bad, but I think I messed up. And sometimes I would forget. Sometimes I'd add an extra turn, stuff like that. And I'm sure like if Kelsey was there, she'd be like, oh, no, it's totally fine. But like. You know, there was just part of me that was like being like the oh yeah, I've also have to track turns. You know, I also have to track this other thing. So the Sea Wolf King itself, Horde of the Sea Wolf King, worked really well as a zero level gauntlet. I really enjoyed it. It was just like all of the work of Arcane Library, really easy to read, really easy to understand, very table usable. Boy, the difference between like this adventure and 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 Scarlet Citadel, where like Scarlet Citadel has you could fit an entire Arcane Library adventure into one room of Scarlet Citadel. I'm, I'm exaggerating but not by much because it's like six pages long and they're and they're and it's big type in lots of bullets and lots of white space so it was very easy for me to pick up this adventure it's very easy for me to run this adventure with like one small thing which really is the complexity of the map and that in itself isn't so bad except that i have struggled especially with in-person games exactly understanding how i'm supposed to run a map like this online or in person and what I decided to do, I did two things and I ended up using both. One thing I did is I used the Adobe, if you use Adobe Acrobat, you can take a big image and you can print it on sheets of paper. So you can decide how many sheets of paper you want it to fit on. And it will print out eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. I did six. So six, eight and a half, 11, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper in what's called a poster print. And then I cut them so that they would all fit together and I can make one big map. The problem is there's like secret rooms. There's stuff you don't want them to see. You know, there's stuff like that. And you could use like sheets of paper to kind of just show. And maybe that's what I should have done is put that like under an acrylic sheet and use like sheets of paper to use like a fog of war. But because you don't really want them to see too far in the dungeon, doing a fog of war with like a paper map is a little hard to do. So then I, I also said, well, maybe I'll just draw it. And so I started to draw the map. And I used my, I had a, a dry erase uh, a marker on my acrylic sheet with a grid underneath and I would draw the map and it didn't take long to draw it. I was, that was pretty quick until I really realized that, oh my God, I've drawn their path and I've left no room for the middle of the map, which means I drew this like, you know, a little bit more than a half circle and realized that I, I crushed it too much because there's a lot. Of, it's a it's a complex map. Let's take a look at the map. So in the lower in the, in the lower image, I have a picture of the map and, you know, it's a complex map. If you look at they start in the lower left of that map and then my characters started making their way to the to the right. So they were going so, you know, east on the southern side of the map. And then they started to make their way to the caves that are in the lower east, the, the, the southeastern side of the map. And you can looking at it, there are a lot of like little you know small caves loops and lots of things going on there and like drawing all that out, it wasn't terrible to draw that out there was a lot of like the players kind of walking around a corner and i'd kind of show a mark and things like that but then when i got to the upper right part of the map and then started drawing to the west as they explored i realized i left no room for the lake in the middle so i was like i now that i'm totally hosed because like I, i'd have to erase half the map in order to fit in the lake in the middle of the map so at that point i whipped out my poster map version that i had that i printed out in six sheets which wasn't bad and i put that out and then they were like why didn't you use this at the beginning and i said because each sheet even if i used each sheet and on one at a time and added a sheet they still showed more stuff than the characters would necessarily know about now maybe you're like ah who cares right maybe you just put it out and you say who cares but like an example was the lower left side of the map showed the upper room with the th with those little tomb chambers on it i actually had to cut out the secret room because i didn't want to see that even if i used the poster map but then there's a big hole and there was a hole i'm like oh, i'm not saying I'm like i bet there's a secret room there so it's really like mapping is tricky is my my main point i still haven't found a great way to do maps at the table Doing it online, however, is very easy. Albert Rodeo, you drop this map in, you use the Fog of War, you, sh you can show just what they see. Really, really easy to do, really straightforward. So online play would be good. If you use like a monitor up in your in your room with everybody else, and maybe that's what I should have done. I have a big monitor up there. I easily could have used the laptop and showed it off. But I, like, I wanted the analog experience. I, we had This is a group that hasn't been together since before COVID. It's the first time we were together since COVID. And we, we got together for other events, but we didn't get together for a game. And I wanted to use analog tools, but you know, Mapping is tricky when you're using analog tools.
So to give an idea about the game, so one thing that I did that worked really well for this particular adventure, for, for the Horde of the Sea, the, the sea Wolf King, is I did an in-game session zero. So instead of having a session, like a mini session zero where I'm talking to the players about stuff, I instead had an NPC who was a like a Viking, powerful Viking woman that's in front of 40 like people who want to join the Sea Wolves. And I had her explain to them, you know, being a sea wolf is a is is truly embracing a resolute acceptance of death. And one of the characters says, I kill myself. <laughs> and she ah, and falls over. And then she the sea wolf queen, sea wolf captain ran over and said, see, that's right there. That is a true sea wolf. And that one probably got out better than all the rest of you are going to come out. And they were like, oh my God. And I said, one of the other guys goes, throws up. Like, you know. And so right off the bat, I was like, we lost a character within the first two lines of the game. And that was hysterical. And all the players really got like, ah, <laughs> you just took your character and killed them right off the go. And then they're always like, this fine sea wolf whose name was. And, <laughs> and the player's like, Grantha. And it's like, Grantha, that's right. And then later, like, just like, and they're like, wow, how soon we forget? Like, yeah, Grantha. That was probably one of the funnest parts of the game. It was, was the character, the character killing themselves during, <laughs> during the intro thought. So she explained that like, you're very few of you are going to make it out of here. You're going to go over there. If you succeed, you have to find something honorable, yet you have to work together. So I slid in all of my typical session zero stuff. You will not harm any domesticated animals. You will not harm any children. You will not fight each other unless both of you agree. You will not steal from one another. You will not. So all the things and your goal, right? Their goal is to is is valor you know you know like like your 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 goal is like fame and fortune right valor find something find something honorable you have to come back with something physically honorable and then when they heard about the acts of the nine eyes they're like oh we're gonna go find that so it's like okay good they picked up their hook and they they ran with it and it worked out right the game went great they fought their way through they talked to a lot of people they got all the way to the end they got the axe and they succeeded so it worked out it was very good 10 character 10 character deaths six players so that worked out good. And what was I, what I, one thing I found interesting when I was reading over this this particular adventure, it's actually a very friendly adventure. Like right off the bat, you kind of sail in and there's some bandits and there's six bandits and they're cold and hungry and irritable, but they don't attack you. They kind of go towards their their weapons, but they kind of, you know, they're not necessary. They're like, look, maybe you pay us five, you know, maybe you pay us five gold. And, and so one of the players was like, I'm not, you know, they had like conversations and I think one of the players stabbed one of the other bandits and then all the bandits attacked and five of the six characters, four of the five characters that were there at the moment were killed in the first round of combat and the fifth survived. And then four, four new characters showed up in a new boat and they're like, Hey, we didn't, we weren't with that guy. Right. And then the, and then I think they, and then they said like, well, you better give us your gold. And they're like, what about the other boat? And they're like, oh yeah, we'll take that. And so all the bandits, except one of them got into a, one of the, the boat of the people they had just killed and took off. So, you know, they lost four characters out of it, but they got a lot of stuff. And then they also managed to get all of the gear from that. They killed one bandit. So they got the bandits gear and getting the bandits gear is like leather armor, a shield. That shield was like super valuable and a short sword. They're like, wow, a bow, right? A bow, a short sword leather armor and a shield and it was like oh thank god because half of them have like a rope and they don't even have like torches they only had two torches for all the characters but they ended up getting enough torches so you know but it was very one one thing i noticed when i was reading this is like a lot of the chambers it's not like you walk in and you're fighting deadly stuff all the time there are a few ones that were pretty deadly but most of the time when they were traveling through things weren't so bad as soon as they got into a fight they got killed by lots of stuff and they lost a lot of characters but like they found the troll and they avoided the troll they got involved there's the troll look at that guy he's he's not happy he slept at one point the only time they actually saw the troll they knew where the troll was the only time that they saw the troll was when the troll i rolled a random encounter and the troll sleepwalked into the room when they were in the middle of a conversation with with garatha and the troll just started picking up dead dead guards and and chewing them off like like a like a heath bar right just crunching through bodies and then like it didn't like the feet so it'd throw the feet away but it bite it liked the heads and torsos of people and so it'd eat the heads and torsos and it's still like half asleep and they're like just let that thing go and it turned around and wandered away so they never even fought the troll they did fight Gloran garan garatha and her people there were I, I i screwed up and realized there are eight of them i only had four but it worked out with four they killed three of them that's when a whole bunch of other characters died 
And then they ended up beating Garatha and convinced her to go with them in the boat. So then they got in her boat and sailed into the, the river in the middle of the map. And that is where the tomb of that's where the tomb of Scorgald was. And then I had Scorgald show up. They fought Scorgald. Scorgald said, it's either me or her. You give me Garatha and and I will go to rest. And they're like, no, we like Garatha. I don't know why they decided they liked her. She tried to kill them like 20 minutes earlier. But they said, no, we like Garatha. And they fought him. And he was really tough, but he only killed one character. I think he killed one character. He swung twice. And they're like, oh my God, if he sings twice and hits, he's going to butcher us. And he might have, but he didn't. And they beat him. And, and there was a great big cheer. When, the, when I said like, the, you know, you know, describe your killing blow the whole table erupted with oh this is amazing right they really loved it one fun bit that i really enjoyed is that when they were on the boat sailing into that river uh their torch went out and when the torch went out i made it purposefully hard for them to light the torch in the dark that they're they're completely in the dark and they're like lighting the torch and at that point like the sea nymph that they had seen the sea nymph before the sea nymph had sung before but the sea nymph came out of the water, started singing its alluring song. Two of the six characters failed the saves. And it went after one of the characters. And while they're lighting the torch, it crawl, the sea nymph crawls up over the side of the boat and draws out a, a coral dagger, like a, a long coral dagger, and just goes to one of the characters. And he, she, you know, the character is like totally happy with the song and just cuts his throat slowly as his blood pours out. And like, Wee-ka! and everyone else in the boat is freaking out, trying to light the torch. They can, they can see it kind of happening, but they can't really make it out. And this, that was really like a horrible, a horror moment that I really enjoyed was this beautiful sea nymph butchering a character character who is totally taken with her song while they're lighting the torch to try to get everything lit so that was really that was really a fun that was really a fun scene so yeah the, the adventure was a really good time i lo- the adventure is very good i really enjoyed it it was a really fun crawl but it had all the opportunities there it was it had your exploration it had role playing it had combat it had you know all the things that make shadow dark shadow dark like you're worried about your equipment you get a lot of equipment one thing that was kind of surprising is like the people you, if you manage to win that you're like, those bandits have way better gear than your zero level characters have. So then they're going to be decked out in the first scene if they can manage to beat those bandits. And later on, when you're fighting Garatha and her people, then you get really good. You get chain mail armor and long swords and stuff. You get really good weapons. So I was surprised about how much their gear went up like as they went they really upgraded very very quickly and one thing i noticed is like we we managed to get it all done you know we kind of you know hemmed and hawed and, and got started a little late and still it was about three hours a three three and a half hours by the time we were done and i think you could if you explored the whole thing and you were a little bit tighter on time and you were a little bit moved a little bit faster i bet you could easily get through this entire dungeon in, in a four hour in a four hour block i think it fits i think it fits well in a four hour block so I really, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed running this this particular adventure. I thought that that Curse Scroll, Curse Scroll Three, the Sea Kings, and I think you could run like a really fun small campaign here too if you wanted to run a very Nordic Vikingish campaign. There's a lot of material in Curse Scroll Three for running like a Viking campaign. I think you could definitely do it. It'd be very cool. So what are my some other some other thoughts that I have about about Shadow Dark itself? What are what are some of the you know some of the things that that came out to me about Shadow Dark while I was running this this session? So one of the thoughts is like getting a long sword was like getting a Vorpal sword. That people's excitement because the players were really into the style of the game. They were into the grim dark nature. They were into encumbrance and worrying about slots. By the way, one thing I forgot to mention that I put in the notes here is that the slot based encumbrance thing worked really well. That idea that you have a slot you, you either have ten slots or or your strength score in slots, whichever one is higher. And it's very easy to track. So I meant for players, it was very easy to keep track of what they were getting. They just fill it in on the sheet. When they are out of space, they know that they don't have any more encumbrance. They can take stuff off. They're dumping stuff on the floor. So that sort of slot-based encumbrance worked really, really well. That was very easy, very straightforward, way better than like tracking weights of things. The sort of minutia of tracking weights is just too difficult and too much of a pain in the ass, which is why nobody does it. But the idea of like, hey, I can fit so much stuff into a slot or I can fit basically one item into a slot. And that meant that negotiating for things was easy. So a player would say like, hey, I don't have a torch, but I do have a a stick and I have rope and I have oil and they have flint and steel. Can I make a torch? And I was like, yes, but it's going to use up all three of those items. Uh, and, and, you know, and if you were to keep that stuff on hand to use, it's going to take up three slots. So I meant like a torch is still better, 
but you don't have a torch. And so you can use these things together to make a torch, but it uses up either all three items. So that you meant that because of the way that the sort of economy of slots worked, it was easy as a GM to negotiate that. And that worked, that worked really well. The always on initiative worked fine too. I had them roll initiative right in the beginning and that basically we start and then you go around the table and we just kept going around the table. I might've reversed it. I think one thing I would have done is on combat, we would reverse the order and go the other way. And then the next time you roll initiative. So every time you're rolling, you're switching back and forth that way just doesn't feel too static i don't think it matters that much but it might matter i i don't know it probably doesn't matter at all but it's like you know i don't know it, it might just shake things up a little bit if you flip if you flip initiative back and forth every so often the constant pressure of random encounters and failing light was omnipresent that the players really knew hey our torch is going out we know that darkness really sucks especially i didn't really get into the darkness aspect because they were pretty good about tracking torches until the end and then they they let their torch go out in the middle of a river with a murderous sea nymph in there and that was when i'm like i'm i'm definitely going to punish them for letting their torch go out like we're, we're definitely that was a little adversarial but it was adversarial in a good way like it was fun and they oh my god they're so scared so i really like that but but all the players got that and I got that. That the, the idea that like random encounters, the darkness, torchlight, all of that stuff is always there. That that pressure, which is what Shadow Dark RPG is about. It's the in the title, right? That you're scared you're afraid of what's in the shadows, and then the shadows are coming because of the torchlight. So that idea of like when to roll a check and when something when to do just when to just do something was something I had to get my head around a little bit. I don't I think you get there. But I think I actually went overboard in the other direction. I think I went overboard with thinking I'm not gonna ask for checks. When you still do ask for checks, but you just want to ask for checks when something is really risky or has a big chance for fail failure. And an example where I didn't roll for a check and I probably should have was when they were negotiating with Garatha and somebody tried to deceive her. And I should have just had them roll a charisma check. But I didn't really have them roll a charisma check. Instead, I just I kind of rolled a D6 to see how she would act. Like one, two, three, she'd act positively, four, five, or six, she'd act negatively. But that's like the same thing. I should have just rolled, I should have just had them roll a check. I should have had the, the player roll a check instead. But figuring out that the, the rest of the idea of like when you when you go do something, you just do it. If you look behind a pillar, you look behind a pillar. You don't have to roll a perception check. There isn't passive perception. There's not this constant, like, oh, you know, can you read the runes? Yeah, you can read the runes because you're from this society. So reading the runes is what you do. So I it meant that was a lot freer freer with the information that they learned but there were circumstances where they were trying to do something and i was like well it does feel like this is a thing that is risky and doesn't have a natural chance of success but i'm going to avoid rolling a check and i should have just rolled for a check so that took me a little bit of mental energy to, to get through the flat math definitely makes things swingier probably on the damage side and also on the hit point side too especially at low levels but at level zero you have one hit point so it's not swingy you're just dead you're just dying all the time it meant that Almost always. I, I don't think there was ever a time when a character got hit and didn't die because they have one or two hit points. They almost all the time they have one. The median hit points was one on 40 characters. Some of them had two. And I think there was like one or two that had three. But still, you're rolling and you roll a D6, and you get a four. You're killing everybody anyway. So that's not swingy that's just you're dead but i think as you get forward because there you don't because hit points don't add constitution bonuses to them and damage doesn't add ability modifiers to the damage roll it means all of the math on both sides is down which means the die roll matters a lot more that's not that's neither good nor bad if you like that idea that weapon swing really matters the swing of a weapon really matters then this is great if you really are like well i don't know the 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 the, the randomness of the die you know, it does it, it, it that it's going to make it really swingy. Now, you you may, if you're familiar with my stuff for 5e, you might know that I really push for static monster damage in 5e. One of the reasons I push for static monster damage is that monster damage doesn't really matter that much, but it doesn't matter that much because you have all these ability modifiers because it, the damage, it's usually a lot of, it's often a lot of dice. And it doesn't matter that much. And here it does. So I would not recommend static monster damage for, for, Shadow, for Shadow Dark because it's so swingy that you want to roll those dice to see what they're going to do. So I, I, I saw it out, but I didn't see it fully because level zero, you only have one hit point. That's not swingy. That's just dead. So I would definitely say the Shadow Dark RPG and where it fits into the spectrum of TTRPGs is really on that heavy focus, and this is not really a big surprise, on dungeon delving and exploration of, of dangerous places. That idea of lighting mattering, encumbrance, the heavy focus on equipment, always on initiative, the importance of turn order, random encounters, you know, all of that stuff really almost kind of makes it almost like a board game. I said, like, it feels a little bit like dungeon, not in a bad way, right? It's still really fun, but it definitely has that focus on play in the same way that other RPGs have a focus somewhere else. You're not going to look towards fate or dungeon world for your tactical combat game. 
right? It doesn't have, those games don't have tactical combat. In the same way, Shadow, Shadow Dark really doesn't have this sort of character-focused high fantasy that 5e does, right? And that's sort of the big difference. And the example is, if there were two items in Shadow Dark RPG, it would be a completely different game. One of those is the light cantrip. Imagine a character has the light cantrip. About, it feels like about half of this game disappears the minute you have the light cantrip. And the other one would be a bag of holding. If you have a bag of holding, all the encumbrance part of this disappears. With those two items, this would be a completely different game. You, it wouldn't really feel like Shadow Dark at all, which kind of shows the focus that this game has, as opposed to a game like 5e, where really, who cares about encumbrance? I'm sure there's somewhere there's somebody that's tracking encumbrance in 5e. And if you and your group are having fun with it, go with the gods. But I bet you one bag of holding or uh, you know changes that whole thing. Same with the light cantrip. I know people that say, like, well, just remove the light cantrip or any sort of artificial light from your D&D game. And it could feel like this. Sure. You could also just play Shadow Dark. So there's definitely a, a, like a particular focus, a narrow focus. I don't know if it, I would say it's like a narrow because you still have role playing. You still go to town, but it's definitely it definitely feel, felt more procedural than a more open ended or a high fantasy 5e character driven game feels to me. I think it is a very hackable RPG. I bet there are small changes that you could make to this that if you want to, you could kind of drop in and sort of change the feel a little bit. I had heard of other, I don't, you know, if you're a Shadow Dark person, don't yell at me because this is other people's ideas. I'm just bringing them up. So don't, don't, I know you don't get upset, but like you can maximize hit points at first level and just makes your characters a little bit more heroic. I heard somebody say like, oh yeah, one of the things you could do is maximize hit points at first level. And it just gives you a little bit more survivability, right? It's not a ton. It's just enough so that you don't have three freaking hit points at first level. So that's not awful, right? You could do that. You could also do average hit points if you wanted. Now you're starting to say like, why am I just bringing more 5e elements in my Shadow Dark game? And that's a good answer. Like maybe you should just play 5e, right? So it's really, it's really that feel, but there's definitely, it definitely felt like a more hackable RPG because it's already so straightforward and simple to begin with that making slight changes and slight variants on the game. I really feel like you have a lot of room to, to do stuff like that. You have a lot of room to kind of change this game around a little bit like you don't have to hang on quite so much to tracking rounds or tracking turns turn order stuff especially if you're an outland you could just you, you really could just say i'm just going to roll random encounters when i need to move things forward if i you know you could just say like the more you guys spend i'm just going to be keeping a mental idea in my head about how long things are going in the game and i'm going to roll a die now that's pretty arbitrary and that arbitrariness is something that i that i wonder about with shadow dark that you really don't have a lot of room to be kind of an arbitrary GM, an improv focused GM, like I tend to be, because it's so lethal that you could you could do something like say, I'm just gonna roll a random encounter because I feel like things have gotten a little stale, and then kill the whole group. Right. So, you know, that you sort of want to have the system in place so that you can point at the system and make sure all the players are aware of the system so that they know, oh, we we're the ones that really are are deciding how often we're having random encounters by how much stuff we're trying to do in while we're wandering through. Right. So so there's that definite that, that balance there where I would feel like, you know, I'll just roll for a random encounter when I feel like it, except if you roll a random encounter when you feel like it and the group gets wiped out. Well, now you feel bad because you're like, maybe I should have just not done that. And having that turn order around that, that turn order system where you're rolling random encounters every two, every three turns and on a one, you have a random encounter. Maybe you want to do that more. But like I rolled a lot and I didn't get very many random encounters. I only got like three two i think two or three out of the whole four hours it's like i kind of wanted more than that so i don't know so how was it to gm what was it like to gm shadow dark overall great very straightforward again really good writing really easy for me to pick up the adventure and run and i really liked it i, I liked it a lot i didn't i didn't struggle at all you know compared to other rpgs i've run where i've had a little bit of a harder time i didn't have that kind of hard time probably the only thing that i had to really keep track of that was different than what i normally do is that turn order tracking that idea of constantly watching the turns and how they're ticking by and rolling random encounters and i i'm pretty sure i didn't get it right i'm pretty sure i might have added rounds that didn't happen or i missed rounds that could have occurred because there's a lot of conversation going on when i think about like the eight steps from return of the lazy dungeon master and how they would work for a shout out art game i really don't I, I don't i think they would work just fine i think most of them would work just fine the one difference is that i think that the eight steps from return really do focus on more of a character driven high fantasy sort of game 
high fantasy or low fantasy it doesn't really matter although treasure is a big piece of it but they're really that character driven game of what are the character arcs who are the characters what's the focus what's interesting to them what kind of focus and this one the characters especially at level zero but i think even later in the game they could die and you could rotate so you don't want to keep too much track of the characters because they might not be there so you're not fulfilling arcs of characters or major story elements or making sure that the character deck certain quests are focused on the characters like you do in a f- more straightforward high fantasy rpg all the other steps still work what scenes are going to occur most of the time it's going to be like well you're delving in a dungeon so you don't really have to worry about scenes secrets and clues still matter locations still matter npc still matter monsters still matter treasure still matters you know all the other parts of it your of, of the eight steps are still worthwhile many times the adventure is going to have it for you so for the shadow dark one i had a strong start which worked really well that idea of the in-person or the in-game session zero of you know you're all going to die you, you you must accept death in deep into your heart and it's one thing to accept death here when you're all cheering and talking and it's something else to accept death when a rune bear has disemboweled you and is playing cat's cradle with your innards right and that sort of speech of like essentially don't come crying home to mama when you're when you die over there was me telling the players don't you all cry when your characters die so that was fun right but that's the strong start worked i did have secrets and clues i didn't really reference them i didn't need them because the adventure is so well written the secrets and clues are already in there when they go to a place and they learn something i could just tell them so the adventure was so well i really didn't need any of the prep steps in order to run it and that's saying that's saying a lot like the eight steps are there to help for for fill in the things that you don't really have at the game i had everything i needed so it worked out really well. You probably don't want to mess with the dials, right? I talk about the dials of monster difficulty for 5e, changing up the number of monsters, the hit points of the monsters, the amount of damage they do, the number of attacks they have. You probably don't want to go screwing with those in Shadow Dark because, again, turning the dials in any direction is either going to make things too easy or too hard really quickly. And, and it really breaks the role of being a neutral arbiter a neutral GM when you're running the game. That idea that like you're letting the dice really manage how things work out. You, you know, roll for random encounters. If you don't roll one, they don't happen. If you roll three ones in a row, they get three random encounters. And you know, that that whole being a neutral arbiter, you know, because the game is that deadly, I think it's harder to be that sort of improv DM who just kind of moves things forward because you feel like the pacing should should let move, move things forward. You can get there, but again, you're going to feel bad if you end up wiping out a bunch of characters because you were bored and you're like, I'm, all they're doing is talking, so I'm going to roll a random encounter. And you roll, uh oh, like seven stingbacks coming, start wiping you out. You know, you're probably not going to feel great about that. The monster stats were great. I really enjoyed that. Rolling for monster hit points was fun, but one thing I did is like bandits had four hit points and I was like, well, I'm going to roll die. What if you roll an eight? It's going to take eight characters to kill him. So I, I was like, well, I'm going to roll like a cap of four. So you can, you know, you can fudge. I fudged a little bit, but the fudging I did was like some of them had less than four hit points. Some of them have four just because I wanted things to kind of move a little bit faster. So is that arbitrary? Maybe, right? But it was fine. So what are my favorite parts? What did I really enjoy about this? I loved projecting the danger that was lurking in the shadows. I love talking about how their torchlight only went out so far and they didn't know what was on those edges. And that that idea of like people who would kind of scout ahead. I was like, you're scouting into the shadows? And they're like, I guess. And then they, they'd see things out there. They'd see, they're like they're, they saw the nymph early. They saw her crawling around in the ground with this coral dagger. And they're like, we got to get the hell out of here. She's bad news. And she's singing to herself, but it's just alluring enough that they're like, oh, that's bad. So that's really fun. And I, I liked not worrying about murdering the characters. The idea that they had 40 character sheets in front of them and that they were willing to have a character die during the intro meant that they were okay with their characters dying and new characters would come in. It was really hard for me to keep track. I just had to start calling out player names because I was never going to remember these character names. So I, I kept the initiative in order of the players and I, sco- I stopped paying attention to the names of the characters because there was no way I could keep track when they lost. You know, We had a total of 16 characters that cycled through i'm never going to remember all that but i enjoyed i enjoyed murdering the characters so some final thoughts a i really loved shadow dark it was really fun to play i am looking forward to running a campaign i don't think it's going to be the kind of game that you would run like a multi-year campaign or like a year-long campaign is i think the stories for them are going to be relatively thin because the characters are relatively thin and they're going to die so how much of a story can you have and this gets on this idea that it focuses really on one specific style of ttrpg play that gritty low power fantasy dungeon delve which is really different than the high power heroic character driven stories that we typically see in 5e games it's awesome it means we've got this big spectrum you really have 
what I love is we have these really well done RPGs that all kind of fill different gaps, right? If you want super tactical, you know, lots of options, lots of character customization, lots of decisions that you make each turn, you have like your Pathfinder 2s, right? Pathfinder 2, heavy mechanic system, still high fantasy, still very character driven, and you have lots of stuff that you can look at there. Then you have like 5e, things are a little looser, there's some flexibility in like how you run things if you want to run theater of the mind versus grid, it doesn't necessarily require tactical combat to run. You have just do one big action, right? But it's still very heroic fantasy. We saw 5e, all the new 5e variants are offering feats at first level. That's huge. The idea that you can defeat at first level is really huge. And then you have these, a lot of these sort of old school Renaissance style games. Shadow Dark is probably the easiest one of those to kind of pick up and run, especially if you run 5e because you're going to recognize a lot of the mechanics. But it has this very different sort of grim, dark character death is always there. It's, oh, you know, the one bad roll or good roll, depending if you're the monster or not, could, could put your character out of commission and really heavily focused on this idea of exploration torchlight encumbrance you know cycles are always moving random encounters and everything else that sort of old school style of play is well encapsulated in the shadow dark the shadow dark rpg and so finally I loved it. My players loved it. My group was there. We had been talking a little bit about running a Shadow Dark campaign after we were done with Scarlet Citadel. And the only part of it that was difficult there is that we were like, well, do we really want to another, run another sort of dungeon crawl focused RPG right after running a big dungeon focused RPG? I don't really know. But even the player who brought that up was like, ah, it's going to be fine. We'll do it. So we're going to see. I, but I think like if we do it, it's probably going to be a short campaign. I don't think we're going to do, I don't think it's because I, I don't think Shadow Dark campaigns run that long. I don't know how long they run. There's certainly enough in there that they, they have got liches and dragons and all sorts of big things in the end. I just think you're going to end up like the character cycle is going to be pretty high. So I don't know. I haven't run a long campaign. I haven't really talked to many people who've run long campaigns, but I think a short campaign I could definitely see. So we're very eager. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And then if you are want to know more about Shadow Dark and like when I was doing the deep dive of the game itself, when I was doing my prep for this game, I have two other videos. You can find those in the show notes. If you like this video and you want more stuff like this, please consider subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter. You get a weekly RPG related email sent directly to your inbox and a free adventure generator PDF that's all absolutely free. You can also join the Sly Flourish Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of cool stuff. The City of Arches Sourcebook, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, video previews, monthly Q&A, dedicated Discord server, all kinds of stuff you get for joining the Patreon. Or you can pick up any of my books, including Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, the Lazy DM's Workbook, and the Lazy DM's Companion, which have tools for pretty much any fantasy RPG that you can pick up. You can find those in the Sly Flourish bookstore. All of the links for those are in the show notes. Thank you all so much. Have a great day and get out there and play a role-playing game.